Hi everybody and welcome back to ICDATWF channel. In today's video we'll have a good in-depth look at the Signetics 82S100 PLA that was used in a lot of digital devices in the 1970s and 1980s. In this picture you can see a 1982 PLA marked C64A that's inside one of my SX64 computers. It is actually a functional equivalent device made by Fairchild as I have not found any original 82S100 chip on any of my computer and peripherals collection. Commodore used this in the greater circuit in various of their computers, including the PET 8296, the CBM2 line, the C64 and the C16 and PLUS4 line. This is the first page of the 1975 datasheet of the 82S100. This is a programmable digital circuit that can implement a quite large amount of combinatory logic functions, at least for the 1970s standards. It has 16 inputs, 8 outputs and 48 product terms, and we'll see shortly what this all means. This is the internal block diagram of the PLA. All those S-shaped links are actual fuses that can be blown or not during the programming phase. By selectively blowing these fuses, we can implement up to 48 logic and combination of all the inputs, either in the direct or negated form. These AND functions are called the product terms. And here we can see some of the actual C64 PLA product terms. The link to this document is in the description. Then we can combine any of the product terms into eight different logic OR functions, each for one of the eight outputs. These OR functions are called the SUM terms. As a last step, we can optionally invert each of the outputs by blowing the S fuses. Again, here we can see some of the actual sum terms of the C64 PLA from the same document as before. However, the PLA couldn't be programmed with a generic EEPROM programmer. Only few high-end device programmers supported them. I don't have a complete list of the suitable programmers, but I'm showing the most famous ones. And after some years of occupations, I finally got one of them too. It is the Data IO 2900. After Signetics have been incorporated into Philips semiconductors, the 82S100 has been renamed as PLS100. Also, Fairchild Semiconductors was also making a compatible part, the 93459 PLA, which is functionally equivalent to the 82S100 but has a different programming algorithm and it was supported by even fewer device programmers. Since Commodore used the chips in some of the most successful computer lines, they decided to make their own compatible PLAs. But of course, they didn't need to make them feel programmable. They just had a different metal mass that connected the right links during the production process. In this picture, there are two examples of most technology mass programmed PLAs. Both are C64 PLA and both of them are not working anymore, as it seems the clones had some reliability issues. So, what are the available options if we need to replace a broken PLA? Actually, a lot. I won't cover them all here. I'll just mention a few of them and then I'll show you how to program a blank PLA and some interesting things I've learned in the process. If you have a suitable programmer like I do, an option would be finding a new stock PLA to be programmed. Unfortunately, all the various field programmable devices are long gone out of production and the remaining stock commands high prices. The only exception seems to be the Fairchild PLA, but my programmer doesn't support it. Then there are no guarantees that the chips are really never programmed. The best general purpose replacement are instead based on uh, modern logic devices that can be programmed with the same equation used in the original PLA. There are many different solutions out there, but my personal favorite is this, 
designed by Mattis Lind and completely open source. It uses a device that's still in production that can accept the exact product and some terms of the original PLA that runs on 5 volt supply too and it can fit in the same footprint of the original one. It also has very similar delays from input to output so it is probably a perfect replacement although I never needed to try it. The last, the easier but also the worst method in my opinion to replace a PLA is using a 64KB EEPROM like a 27C512. We need to build a simple socket adapter as shown on this website that I have linked in the description. I said that's the worst method because the input to output delay is almost never as low as the one of a real PLA. Basically, a 27512 EEPROM has the same number of inputs and the same number of outputs of an 82S100 PLA. But a PLA implements a function, for example in this picture I have drawn a simple multiplier. A memory device, uh, instead, like an EEPROM, can still behave as a multiplier if we store in each memory cell a single result and we use the inputs to address the correct result. However, despite its drawbacks, I decided to make my quick and dirty socket adapter and I programmed a 19 nanoseconds 27C512 EEPROM and that makes a C64 start fine. So it's a good and quick test to substitute a broken PLA until you get a better replacement. Now, someone is surely wondering why I've got a fine USA-made professional device programmer now that unprogrammed PLAs are so scarce and highly priced. In a distant past, most of the Western electronic integrated circuits were regularly reverse engineered and cloned in the Eastern countries, as that probably allowed to quickly clone complete devices of all sorts. As you can see in this list, the 82S100 was no exception, and it was still produced several years after the Western counterpart was already being discontinued. Now, it turns out that most of the Soviet era integrated circuits are still available in large quantities are generally reliable and are often found at very reasonable prices, so I thought I'd give them a chance. As a start, I've just ordered a single chip, as I don't know if these are really unprogrammed and if it's really a so good clone that my western programmer can write to it without issues. First, I need the fuse map, so I've checked on zemers.net uh, where all Commodore information uh, is archived. I found these two files that both contain a JDEC file for the C64 PLA fuse map. So I've just loaded the first one into my Data IO 2900, put the chip into the programmer socket and finally selected the program function. And now the newly programmed part is ready to go into the SX64 from which I took the Fairchild PLA for demonstration. Now I know it's not the best place to test a new chip because to access this socket one must remove almost everything but I managed to put the replacement chip in place without uh, removing the board so will it work? Will it work? Looks like is it not working. We have a black screen. Hmm. Interesting. Let's try to figure out what went wrong. First of all, I trust the data your programmer. So far, it never failed to program other devices. And I have other programmers of the same brand and their quality is outstanding. I also trust the Soviet chip to be fine. It always verifies correctly when checking the fuse map. By comparison, I tried to read the third child PLA that's not algorithm compatible with the 82S100 and it gives uh, an impossible fuse map. I really suspect there is something wrong with the JDEC fuse map that we found in the first zip archive on the Zimmers.net site. So I had a look at the other JDEC file that's inside the c64pla.txt file and also I started a thread on the CBN hackers mailing list asking for opinions. Here is the second fuse map, unfortunately it is incomplete because as you can see there are three missing lines. 
However, it gives a few very useful information. First, it is a dump obtained with a data IO programmer. Second, the fuse checksum is different from the one of the first JDEC file I've tried. Then, from the CBM hackers thread quickly emerged that some programmers have a bug on the input fuse mapping so that the inputs are swapped. Hmm, what does this exactly mean? Let's compare the data IO dump that I trust is uh, correct apart from the missing lines with the one I've used to program my test PLA. In an 82S100 fuse map, we first see 32 fuses that are two for each input pin. One is for the unchanged input, the other is for the inverted input. So we get 32 fuses for the first product term. Then we have 8 fuses to use or not this product term on each output. Then we get again 32 input fuses for the second product term and again 8 output fuses. At the end of the map we have the 8 S fuses that can optionally invert each output. So back at our, our map comparison, the first 32 bits are the fuse map of the inputs to the first product term. We observe that each fuse pair is swapped. We have the sequences 1, 0 and 0, 1 that are inverted on the two maps. Of course, 1, 1 and 0, 0 remains the same. After 32 bits with swapped pairs, we find a sequence of 8 bits that's identical in both dumps. So, one programmer has the non-inverted and inverted fuse swapped. Let's see now what are the options to get a working fuse map that produces a good PLA on my programmer. First option, I could complete the partial data IO dump with the data from the swapped dump. Of course, swapping back the bits on the input fuses. This requires me to write some program to help in, the, in this process. Second option is to swap all the first 32 bits on each line of the wrong dump, since the fuse map has a much easier layout in this case, having all the 40 bits of every product term plus the output bits on a separate line. Also, this operation requires a program that to help in the task, but I figured it was enough, simple to be done, albeit in a very quick and dirty way, as shown in these few lines of C code. The third option I considered is using all the product and some equations contained into the PLA dissected document and feed them to an old version of the couple logic device compiler running on MS-DOS that supports the 82S100 PLAs. And I also did this as a backup if the bit swap method fails for some reasons. Of course, I should mention that uh, if I had a real program at 82S100, I could just read the fuse map out of it, but I don't have any, unfortunately. What I found out is that in the year 2020, I haven't been able to find a good complete dump of the original C64 PLA fuse map, in JDEC format at least. Now, once I run the swap program on the swapped dump, I tried to load this dump into my 2900 programmer. I left the checksum field in the new map with all zeros, so the 2900 calculated a data checksum for me. It says 7F5D. But wait a moment, isn't that the SAC checksum of the incomplete data IO dump? Yeah, it is exactly that. Of course, a checksum does not guarantee that the data is really identical, but it's a very encouraging thing. Having also verified that the Soviet PLAs are indeed compatible and not programmed, I ordered a larger set of them this time, and finally I'm ready to test the new fuse map. The device quickly programmed and verified with the good checksum. So this time I installed the uh, newly written PLA into my uh, test board, C64 test board, for which I don't have a case since it was uh, lost. Uh, I found a broken case and broken keyboard with this port in the trash uh, many years ago, um, just fixed the board and I used for test is uh, my um, previous made uh, 8701 uh, prototype 
which is still here. And there is the Soviet PLA and let's power on. Yes, we have a start screen, looks fine. Um, let's see if program works, uh, demo and so on. Of course, the demo is not the uh, best thing to test a PLA replacement. Uh, it should be tested with uh, some type of cartridges that exploit some teaming issues on the uh, PLA signals. But this is a real PLA. It has the same uh, delays uh, of the original uh, 82S100, which was the original chip used by Commodore engineers. It gets quite warm, like the original 82S100 probably, so, but it's not very hot like uh, the other chips in this board, so it is acceptable. So I hope you found it interesting this video about the ATTOS 100 original PLA and the most uh, close uh, replacement we can find today. If you find it interesting uh, um, to learn something about it, um, thank you for watching.